Okay. How do I hit the next slide, or is there a button or something? Pointer is the thing in the front, right? Yeah. Okay. So how do I make it full size? Okay. So um, I'm here today just to talk to you, just for uh, give a talk about uh, EMG and nerve conduction studies and how to, you know, order them, how to interpret them. So basically, we use EMG and nerve conduction studies when we suspect a disease involving the peripheral nervous system, anywhere from the motor neuron out to the nerve root, the plexus, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction and uh, muscle, okay? So the complaints that we, uh, patients have numbness, tingling, pain, decreased sensation, cramping, spasms, weakness, gait difficulty, or, or fatigue, or fatigable weakness. These are the symptoms that result in the, in the test being done. Uh, oftentimes also we will be asked to do EMG and nerve conduction studies in the critical care setting where the patients had a generalized weakness, uh, difficulty weaning from mechanical ventilation, an acute or unexplained onset of respiratory failure, or a suspected critical illness, neuropathy, or myopathy. So what are the components of an EMG? Well, first of all, let, let me just show you here. This is a motor nerve conduction study being performed here, okay? So what we have here is an active electrode here, okay? This is the cathode. This is the anode here. Reference electrode, active electrode. The active electrode is placed over the most convex part of the muscle, okay? In this case, this muscle here is called the abductor pollicis brevis. So in EMG and nerve conduction studies, you have to know anatomy, otherwise, is, so you need to know, for example, that this muscle is innervated by the T1 anterior horn cell, lower trunk of the brachial plexus, and the median nerve, okay? So that, that's the way, that's the peripheral supply of this muscle. So the reference electrode has to be in, at an adjacent non-muscular site, okay, which is usually a tendon or bone. And what this, what, what this measures here is the voltage difference between the active and uh, uh, reference electrode. This is an external stimulator, okay, which applies a current okay, from the cathode anode here. Okay. So what this does is it, depolari it's, it, 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 it depolarizes the external membrane. Okay which results in charge traveling into the, to ground in the machine, okay, into the cathode, which makes the external part of the membrane, uh, which is usually positive, it loses positive charge, okay? A loss of positive charge outside the nerve membrane relatively depolarizes the inside of the membrane. The inside, it depolarizes the membrane to threshold or above threshold, sodium channels open, and an action potential is generated, okay? So what we do on this machine is we apply increasing amounts of current, okay, until the response here, which is measured from here, which is called a compound muscle action potential response, until this gets no, no bigger, okay? It's what we call supra-maximal nerve stimulation, okay? So when we stimulate the median nerve here, we keep stimulating it and raising the current until we actually go about 25% more current than is needed to give the maximal response. That's called supra-maximal nerve stimulation. Why is that important? Because everywhere we do uh, our nerve conduction stimulation, we need to have supra-maximal stimulation because we need to know that all the nerve fibers in that nerve have been stimulated, okay? So that we compare like with like at each level, okay? So here we have this response, and you can see that there must be a heterogeneous population of nerve fibers within the median nerve here that supply the uh, motor nerve fibers, in this case, to, the, uh, uh, to this muscle. Because if they were all homogeneous, meaning if they were all the same diameter, they had the same amount of myelin around them, they were just all identical, then this response here would simply be a sharp spike, okay? But it's not, meaning that the motor nerve fibers here that supply this muscle vary in diameter, they vary in, in uh, mile, degree of myelination, okay? 
those that are most myelinated and have the largest, uh, are, that are the largest and are the most myelinated, determine the latency of the response, meaning the, the, the time it takes for this muscle, okay, to, re to react to the arriving action potentials. This is called the distal motor response latency, okay. If there is a delay in conduction between here and here, you know, often due to carpal tunnel syndrome or it could be demyelinating neuropathy or Guillain-Barre, whatever, this here will be prolonged, okay, by about 20 percent over normal. And we have normals here for each of the nerves for their distal latencies, median nerves four milliseconds, okay. Now, why do we stimulate proximally here? Why can't we just measure the distance from this point to that point and then sub divide using the amount of time? That will give you the conduction velocity. Well, that's not uh, physiologically valid because there is another process that occurs from the action potential arriving here to generate this response. It's not just nerve conduction. There's also neuromuscular transmission, and neuromuscular transmission takes time too. So therefore, to measure the true nerve conduction velocity, we need to stimulate proximally, okay, which is at the elbow. Okay? And then we subtract the distal latencies, this distal latency from that distal latency, and we measure the intercathodal distance, you know, here, here. Then we have a true, pure motor nerve conduction velocity between these two points, okay? And that's 50 meters per second, okay? So, 50 meters per second or over is normal, okay? Uh, now, a sensory nerve conduction study. Uh, in this case, this is called an orthodromic sensory conduction study. We use ring electrodes. We wrap them around the A finger, and we need to know what the uh, 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 nerves are, digital nerves are in this finger. On the palmar side, they are median, and on the back, they're radial. So in this case, we're stimulating digital nerves in this finger, radial and median digital nerves, sensory nerves. We have a recording electrode, cathode, anode, over the median nerve, okay? So we're going to be measuring action potentials that are conducted up the median nerve. We use supramaximal stimulation, the same as in the motor nerve conduction study, and we're recording, instead of from a muscle now, we're recording from the nerve, okay? So you can see here, this is what the sensory nerve action potential looks like. This is stimulating second finger, third finger, fourth finger, thumb, okay? And, you know, normal here is about six, seven microvolts, and it should be 50 meters per second or more. In the upper extremity, sensory and motor conduction studies are 50 uh, meters per second or more. In the lower, nerve, lower extremities, there are 38, 38 meters per second or more. It's slower in the lower extremities because of the, the lower extremities more exposed to uh, temperature, a colder environment. Nerve conduction studies need to be done warm. If you do them cold, you'll have artificial slowing uh, of the conduction velocity, and you'll have distal latency prolongations. Yes? Are those electrodes uh, the needles in the nerve? Or no. These aren't needles in a nerve. These are surface elect over that. You can see here that this is where the median nerve would be, right? If you wanted to stimulate, if you wanted, remember we're stimula stimulating median and radial digital nerves here. If we wanted to record from the radial nerve, we'd put it over the anatomical snuff box here. Okay? You can do what are called near nerve recordings using needles, very thin filamentous needles that you put, stick in to right and adjacent to the nerve. But it's painful uh, it's research. We, we don't do it. How do you account for impedance by, you know, subcutaneous? We do, yeah. That's why you, you know we have normal normals, population normals established, okay. But if the, if the limb is massively swollen, and you order EMG nerve conduction studies, and someone who has an enormously lymphedematous limb uh, is not going to be uh, very uh, useful, okay. So. So we're measuring latency, motor latency. Oh, wait, I didn't. So in the so to in order to determine the nerve conduction velocity here, we can measure cathode to cathode distance, and use the latency of this response. We get sensory nerve conduction velocity. So it is valid for sensory nerves. We don't need to do use two stimulation points. We can just use one, because there's no neuromuscular transmission here. Everything's just pure nerve conduction. Okay. So we might want to know the latency. We want to know the amplitudes and the conduction. Uh, velocity, okay? So, the next thing that we use is we have what are called late responses, okay? Now, in the case of the F wave, 
okay? If we go back, okay? So, this is a motor nerve conduction study setup, right? If I were to uh, uh, change the sweep speed here, actually you can kind of see it here. See this little irregularity here? Right now this is set at 5 millivolts per division. So these responses are nearly 10 millivolts here, 8 millivolts, 7.5 millivolts here. There's a little irregularity bump out here, okay? What happens is, when we do a supermaximal stimulation here, we have orthodromic action potentials that run down here and cause this response. But the nerve here is just a wire. We also cause action potentials to travel this way, the reverse. Okay? It goes both ways. Okay? And the action potentials that travel backwards, antidromically, they go all the way up the wire, in this case to the, because uh, we're recording from this muscle, from the t to the T1 anterior horn cell. But basically it's going to travel all the way up the median nerve, okay, to the uh, parts of the me median nerve that innervate the muscles, okay, and they, they are C7, C8, T1, you know, from the pronator teres, forearm muscles down to the, the thenar muscles here. So those responses travel up, and when they enter the axon hillock of the anterior horn cells, okay, they die out, all right? The, most of them just, they don't rebound and come back down. But a very, very small number, maybe 2%, two, 2%, two 3%, come all the way back down here and are registered as a little blip here, okay? And uh, in other words, a small a number of muscle fibers or motor units react, okay? And that, the time that that takes depends on the length of the limb, <coughs> okay? Depends on the length of the limb and the nerve conduction velocity throughout the uh, extremity, okay? So here are F waves. They, they, they occur with supermaximal stimulation here, which is this, is comp you know, this is the orthodromic response here. And these are the antidromically rebounded late responses from the anterior horn cells, okay? And they vary in shape and latency. They're called F waves, okay? And in this case, since we're recording from the APB, which is innervated by the T1 nerve root, if there was a radiculopathy, okay, then uh, these median F waves would be prolonged in the case of a T1 radiculopathy. If we were recording from a C8 innervated muscle, like an ulnar innervated muscle in the hand, then, th then that would be C8 radiculopathy if they were prolonged. Okay? But they can be prolonged from a anything wrong along the course of the pathway. Okay? You know, anything. It could be, they can be prolonged from carpal tunnel, they could be prolonged from peripheral neuropathy, you know, axonal or demyelinating, or they can be prolonged due to a problem in the plexus or nerve root. The, the, okay? Okay, the way to distinguish the uh, localization of the reason why they're prolonged is using the sensory nerve conduction study. Now, now the sensory nerve conduction study here, okay, if, if that's normal, okay, and you have prolonged F waves, reduced amplitudes of this response, okay? But the sensory nerve conduction studies are normal, okay? Then that tells you that the problem has to be proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, okay? Why is that? Because the dorsal root ganglion keeps the axons that you're stimulating down here in the fingers healthy, okay? That's the nerve cell for, from which we have orthodromic and antidromic uh, 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 transport of, uh, you know, uh, uh, mitochondria, uh, receptors, everything that's needed to keep the nerve working, okay? So if you were to cut the dorsal rootlet, sensory rootlet, which is proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, you understand that you would have complete dermatomal sensory loss in, in that in territory of that nerve root, right? But despite the presence of complete absence of any sensation, Okay, let's say it's uh, this finger, let's say C6, and you cut the C6 rootlet. If you stimulate the thumb and record from the median nerve or the radian, ra radial nerve here, okay, you would have perfectly normal response, even though the patient has no feeling there. That's because that tells you if the sensory nerve conduction studies are normal in someone who has numbness and tingling, that tells you the problem is proximal to the dors dorsal root ganglion. Okay? If it's reduced okay, or absent, that tells you there's been a loss of sensory axons, okay? Distal to the dorsal root ganglion. Do you, uh, you understand that? Okay. So, that's the F wave latency. So that gives you, it's a retrograde rebound motor impulse. It travels the full length of the motor axon and back. And it, so it gives you more information about the proximal segments, right? 
when I was showing the motor nerve conduction studies are done along the core, along between the, we're measuring conduction velocity here. So you might ask, well, why can't we just stimulate the nerve up here? Well, it gets a little more complicated because we're not stimulating the median nerve up here in the axilla and in the herbs point. You're stimulating the plexus. So you can't selectively stimulate median motor fibers in the plexus. You end up stimulating everything, okay? So even though you're recording from the abductor pollicis brevis, there are other muscles near there that are, for example, are supplied by the ulnar nerve, and you're, so you're going to change the shape of this compound muscle action potential response, okay? So what's the next response, late response? It's called the tibial H reflex, okay? So in the tibial H reflex, what happens is we uh, put our active electrode over the soleus muscle, okay, which is right under the medial belly of the gastrocnemius. We have a reference electrode over the distal gastrocnemius tendon, okay, or soleus gastrocnemius tendon. Now, what we do is in the popliteal fossa, okay, we stimulate the tibial nerve. And we use a very long duration stimulation. We use uh, the longest duration of the nerve stimulation on an EMG machine is one millisecond. So we use the po longest possible sensory, longest possible stimulation response. And then we start increasing the amperage or current, okay? So what we use are very, very low amounts of current, but very long duration stimuli. Those types of stimuli selectively stimulate the largest myelinated nerve fibers. Okay? And the largest myelinated nerve fibers in the tibial nerve, or any nerve, right, are the 1B and 1A fibers. Okay? Okay? These are fibers that are innervating muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. These are the most rapidly conducting nerve fibers in the nervous system. Okay? It also happens to stimulate uh, uh, extrafusal and intrafusal uh, 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 efferent fibers that supply extrafusal and intrafusal muscle, okay? So what we get is a small M, what we call M response, an orthodromically conducted uh, action potential from the soleus muscle, okay? And that's from stimulating here, the, the, this muscle fiber here, okay? Or, I mean the uh, motor nerve fiber here in the tibial nerve. But at the same time, we're selectively stimulating these 1A, 1B fibers, okay? Now, what happens there? Well, we get this response here because of stimulating the motor nerves, and we get this re late response called an H reflex, which is because of the volley here from the 1A and 1B afferent volley enters the dorsal root entry zone, okay? We're recording from the soleus muscle, which is innervated by the S1 nerve root, and what happens is you get a, a reflex, like a Ankle jerk. It's the same thing as an ankle jerk. Okay, you have a mo uh, it's an mono and oligosynaptic reflex from the one B and one A fibers, the Golgi tendon, muscle spindle innervating fibers, and it's called an H reflex because of the sh its shape. It's different than an F wave in that it's uh, the same shape, doesn't vary, and it uh, <coughs> doesn't vary in latency either, and you get it with sub maximal stimulation. With the F wave, you get it with supra maximal stimulation. So, in a patient with a problem in this afferent or efferent pathway, okay, either one, the limb of either one, you're going to have this response is going to be prolonged. And we have normals for height for this response, the H reflex. So, in the case of a patient, for example, who has, uh, you know, numbness, tingling on the plantar aspect of the foot. Uh, radiating pain down to the plant, down the leg, down to the posterior lateral leg, down to the plantar aspect of the foot, with no weakness, okay, absent clinical ankle jerk. It, this reflex, okay, will be, if it's an S1 radiculopathy that's interfering with conduction through these fibers, okay, this reflex will be prolonged or absent, okay, and you can compare it side to side. So, Okay, you don't, we can move on from that. This isn't really, you're not going to need this in pain. It's all right. Okay. So, in needle EMG examination, we study the muscle at rest, okay? Meaning we stick the concentric needle into the uh, uh, muscle, fi muscle. And we also look at activity 
when the patient recruits the muscle or voluntarily contracts the muscle. And at rest, the muscle should be silent, okay? So there should be no spontaneous activity. It should be a nice flat line, okay? Uh, during activity, the electrical shape and pattern of the response can distinguish between nerve and muscle disease, meaning the, the shape of the motor units and the way that they're recruited helps you distinguish nerve and muscle disease, okay? In nerve disease, you don't have enough motor units, okay? So the recruitment of the motor units is in increased. You have high frequency recruitment. In a muscle disease, you have a normal number of motor units. It's just that each motor unit generates a reduced amount of t contractile strength. So you end up with increased recruitment, early recruitment of motor units. You know what motor units are, right? They're the number of muscle fibers that are supplied by an individual anterior horn cell. That's what a motor unit is, okay? So in a nerve disorder, right, that affects motor nerves, uh, causing weakness, you're going to have an inadequate number of axon, motor axons, which each of which supply a group of muscle fibers called a motor unit. So you're going to have an inadequate number of motor units, either as a result of loss of anterior horn cells, or loss of axons, or blocked axons, demyelinated axons. Bottom line is that there's not going to be enough of them, and those that are getting all the way down to the muscle, they're going to have to work extra hard to generate the same amount of strength. How do they work extra hard? They just fire more frequently, okay? And there's a limit to how fast they can fire. Motor units in the human nervous system can't really fast more than, can't really fire, I'm sorry, fast, fire more than 30 times a second, okay? So, uh, normal recruitment in, uh, is around, you know, anywhere between 5 and 12 times per second. In a myopathic process, the motor units fire, don't, fa don't fire fast enough, and they're, so you need to bring in, recruit more motor units earlier than normal. That's called increased recruitment, okay? And in that case, motor units fire less than five times a second in a muscle disease. So, here, for example, we put the needle in, and it's a concentric needle, meaning the bore of the needle, okay, is the active electrode. Okay, the central part and the, uh, the, the uh, 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 surrounding part is the reference electrode. So the needle itself is its own active and reference electrode. Okay? Uh, so it goes in here, sticks it in, and this is a common finding. This is called insertional activity. When you stick the needle in, you might just have a little, <coughs> little reaction from the muscle, and you can hear it. Okay? Uh, but everything it should be flat. Okay? So, so here... You put the needle in, you have a, this is a ground, and you need to know, obviously, when you put a needle into a muscle, you need to know there's no point doing this unless you know exactly the anatomy of what you're doing, okay? So we look for insertional activity, spontaneous activity, motor unit configuration, motor unit recruitment, and an interference pattern. The spontaneous activity are, are <coughs> individual muscle fiber discharges due to membrane deep uh, 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 instability of individual muscle fibers. Individual muscle fibers become electrically unstable and spontaneously fire on their own, okay, as a result of two mechanisms, either because of denervation supersensitivity, meaning when you denervate muscle fibers, they upregulate their nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. They have way more than normal, so they become a little, they become uh, twitchy, uh, prone to uh, conducting uh, uh, action potential spontaneously across the synapse, okay? And that's called fibrillation potential. Same thing as a positive sharp wave. They basically mean the same thing. They're spontaneous muscle fiber discharges that you pick up with the needle EMG, okay? The, uh, so the way that, so that can be due to denervation supersensitivity, which is a res result of motor nerve disease, okay? Okay. It can also be due to muscle fiber necrosis, splitting, in other words, a destructive or inflammatory muscle disease. So fibrillations and positive sharp waves do not distinguish nerve and muscle disease. They just tell you there's a nerve and muscle disease. Okay? Now, they take, if there's a nerve condition or a muscle condition, they take approximately two to three weeks to develop. The closer the nerve injury is, to the muscle that you're, you got your needle in, 
the quicker they'll develop. They can develop as soon as a week after uh, a nerve injury. If they develop due to a nerve injury, they mean that there's a loss of motor axons, okay? Not demyelinating. There has to be disruption of the axon supplying the muscle to get these changes, okay? So that's one of the reasons why ordering an EMG nerve conduction study within a week after your symptoms began I is not useful, okay? Because it doesn't help you distinguish an axon discontin discontinuity versus an axon block, okay? Meaning from demyelination, which is better? Axon loss or axon block? Yeah, right, you don't want to lose axons, right? And then they have to grow back, and that takes months, right? Okay. So, so that's the spontaneous activity. So, yeah, just as a, as a rule, calling us up, you know, this guy, he's in the OR, uh, and he woke up from the procedure, he's in a lot of pain, he has total numbness here in the anterior thigh, he's got no knee jerk, he can't extend his knee at all. And what kind of surgery did he have? Oh, they, they were taking out some kind of colon cancer or something in the, around the cecum, and he woke up and he can't extend his knee at all, right? And it's day two or day one, next day or something, and he's got all this numbness, and, right? So, and then, uh, and then you say, oh, well, you know, let's just wait, do an EMG in a week, right? Because then it'll show the fur and diagnose our... But that's not uh, how to deal with this problem, okay? The EMG and nerve conduction studies will take at least a week to show that there has been a complete or nearly complete loss of motor axons. And there's a big difference, by the way. Even if there's uh, just two fibers demonstrating continuity to a muscle, that predicts some recovery. If it's completely gone, what we call a neuronotmetic lesion, then there's very little chance for recovery. So in the case of that patient, for example, you've got to reoperate and you've got to do a nerve repair. You don't wait a, a week to uh, see what the EMG shows. It's not useful, okay? But, for example, if you have a patient wh who had some kind of knee operation, you know, they damaged the common perineal nerve, right? The patient's got a complete foot drop, right, after a hip or knee operation. Let's say it's at the knee. And you think, oh, you injure the common perineal nerve. If you do the study, okay, at the time, within a week of the injury, like just a couple of days after the injury, and a patient with complete foot drop, let's say the common perineal nerve was completely cut, okay, at the fibular head, right, surgically severed, okay. If you stimulate above where the nerve was cut, you'll have no, no visible response, right, and, and you won't be able to get a response from the toe extensor muscles in the foot, let's say, or, or no, vis no, no dorsiflexion. If you stimulate below where the nerve was cut, you'll get perfectly normal, boom, response. Why is that? The nerve has been cut. Why, 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 do you, why do you get a response? Patient can't move it. Exactly. Okay. So you need Wallerian degeneration. So you don't want to order EMG and nerve conduction studies before Wallerian degeneration is finished. That takes a week. So let's say you did do the nerve conduction study wi within a day or two, and it did show, you how would you report that? You would then say there is complete common perineal nerve conduction block across the fibular head, right? Then the surgeon would go, oh, thank God I didn't cut the nerve. The nerve is alive below where the problem is. But it's wrong, right? Because you come back a week later, stimulate there, and then nothing will happen. No, no response, okay? And the fibrillations and positive sharp waves will start to appear like two, three weeks later, okay? So it's critical that you, import, uh, that you uh, understand that. So these are the fibrillations and positive sharp waves, okay? There are other spontaneous things that can happen when we put the needle in the muscle. You can have fasciculations, which are individual motor unit discharges, okay? These ones here, fibrillations and positive sharp waves, are individual muscle fiber discharges. You cannot see these clinically. These are something you see on the needle examination. The fasciculations are spontaneous motor unit discharges, so many muscle fibers discharging all together. So if you have all the muscle fibers in an individual motor unit spontaneously discharging, that's a nerve disease, not a muscle disease, okay? And it's a nerve disease that's chronic because the fasciculation potentials take months to develop. They're a sign of re-innervation, okay? 
Because if you denervate a whole load of muscle fibers belonging to an individual uh, 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 anterior horn cell motor unit, then what will have how the, what the nervous system does is it uses trophic factors to attract new axons from a live remaining motor unit axon uh, that are still working. Those new nerve fibers will re-innervate the denervated muscle fibers and what you end up getting is a motor unit that now has more work to do. Okay? Instead it used to supply a hundred fibers, now it supplies three hundred. Okay? There's been an improvement in strength because now we have re to these muscle fibers but the anterior horn cell and the axon has a lot more metabolic work to do. Okay? And what happens is, is it spontaneously discharges, okay? depolarizes at the nerve or anterior horn cell level. And you see visibly, you see a twitch in the muscle fiber. Okay? So myokymia is uh, when you have ephaptic transmission from one motor nerve fiber to another, an axo-axonic connection. It usually happens in the demyelinating process. Okay? It can happen in radiation plexopathy. Uh, myotonia is, is a muscle discharge, not, a, not, a ner not due to a nerve disorder. Okay. So how do we grade these fibrillations and positive sharp waves? Here's a fibrillation. This is the positive sharp wave. Fibrillation's positive and it's a combination of both. And it's a matter of degree. You know, if they're just present in, in two spots, if they're present in most spots, if they're present in nearly all spots, and then if they're just continuous. And the grading, 1, 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus, it doesn't actually give you a guide to the amount of motor axon loss. All it tells you is that there's been a loss of motor axons. The, the, the more subacute the measurement is when you do the needle EMG, the more the fibs and positives will be there. As the muscle fibers are re innervated you get a lot. These drop off. Okay? You get less fibrillations and positive sharp waves. But the best measure, okay, of the, the, the amount of loss of motor axons, okay, is going to be the, the ion, anyway, it's too far up, is going to be the compound muscle action potential response amplitude that you get in the motor nerve conduction study, right? The surface recorded response. That's a measure of all the motor units in that muscle, okay? All right? And that's a much better measure of motor axon loss than this, okay? But this is highly accurate in telling you that there's been motor axon loss. For example, if you had a patient with a median nerve uh, neuropraxia, complete median nerve neuropraxia here at the wrist, okay, but no motor axon loss, none at all, and you waited your week, two weeks, to see if there were fibrillations and positive sharp waves, well, you wouldn't see them because the, motor ax the axons are all continuous. But you may have only a single motor unit firing, or, or you may have no motor unit recruitment at all. Patient not be able to move that muscle at all. Okay, that the lack of fibrillations and positive sharp waves tells you that the axons are intact. They just need to be uncompressed. Okay, they need to be decompressed. So the next thing we look at is the motor unit recruitment. Okay, it's decreased in a nerve disease and it's increased in a muscle disease, and we need to look at the individual motor units themselves. Okay, so. When we get re innervation the motor unit gets bigger. It gets longer and it gets polyphasic. Polyphasic meaning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times it crosses the baseline there. The normal is four or less. If it crosses four or more, it's polyphasic. And we have normals, for example, this is the quadriceps. A man called Fritz Buchthal in the 50s, you know, he did this on hundreds of people used motor unit analysis. So he would take 20 motor units in an individual muscle and he would you know, take literally pictures of the, what he saw in the CRT and then he would get an average okay, for uh, an individual f in this muscle. And he would do it in a whole series of muscles and he published norms for all the different uh, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and over. Okay? As one gets older, the motor units do prolong a little, probably because of nerve root disease, neuropathy, just things happen and you get older. Okay? Now, but when you get re the motor unit enlarges, prolongs, and becomes polyphasic. 
And when you see these motor units firing, they tell you that re has occurred. And there will be less fibrillations and positive sharp waves. And it also tells you that the process is months old. These re the presence of re motor units takes months, okay? Not weeks, months. So, if we look at the pathophysiology of nerve injury, the mildest form, okay, is neuropraxia. We have a transient disruption of nerve function here. It's a demyelination, okay, a focal demyelination here. What happens when, when, that, when this gets compressed here is that the node of Ranvier at this level here becomes wider or more, more, more spread out, okay? The, in other words, the axon becomes denuded at the node of Ranvier. So normally the paranodal area, which is normally nicely insulated with myelin, myelin becomes exposed. And the paranodal areas contain many less sodium channels than the nodal areas. So what happens is when you have saltatory conduction, leakage of current arrives to the paranodal areas. The paranodal areas are, uh, uh, have a great capacity to suck current or leak current so that the action potential dies out, right? It gets dissipated, spread out, instead of it all being focused in one nodal area. So we have a failure of saltatory conduction. We have block of action potential. That results in weakness, loss of sensation, okay? But when we stimulate the nerve below, we get a nice normal response. We stimulate it above, you get a smaller response. If the response is reduced by 50% or more, that, that's something called a conduction block, okay? And that's a sign of a demyelinating nerve disease. So the next one is axonotmesis, okay? So uh, this is where we have axon damage, actual axon loss, okay? So we get fibrillations and positive sharp waves. We get Wallerian degeneration. We have to be cautious about nerve conduction studies doing them too early, okay? But the, the uh, 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 endoneural connective tissue, epineurium and perineurium are all intact. Now why is that important? Why do you need, why do you need intact endoneural connective tissue? Right, why is that important? Why do you need that for regrowth? Right, so it's like a, you know, the Long Island Expressway. We, 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 otherwise, we'd end up with roads going all over the place, right? Into farmers' fields and the wrong way, and it'd be a mess, right? And what happens if there's a loss of connective tissue in the nerve? How, what, what happens to the re process? Dr. Lopez. What happens to the re process when there's a loss of connective tissue? The yeah, connective tissue is disrupted, the arch nerve architecture is damaged. It's called neurotmesis. Neuromas, okay, neuromas form, okay, yeah, and do we have a recovery of motor function, sensory function? No, it's all screwed up, right, and we have spontaneous discharges occurring at the level, at the, the neuroma, okay, so it's very painful. So, so the axonotmesis, we have a growth rate of about one to three millimeters per day, okay, so it takes months, and as they grow back, we have those wide, enlarged polyphasic motor units, okay? and we have a, a decline in fibrillations and positive sharp waves. So neurotmesis, of course, is the worst form, okay? So, and <coughs> to diagnose these, we, uh, uh, you know, we need time. We need, we need a few weeks for the fibrillations and positive sharp waves to develop, okay? So, uh, all right, so we talked about this. So, um, in a peripheral neuropathy, okay, we have spontaneous activity that takes 7 to 21 days to develop. Depends on the distance of the nerve injury to the muscle that we're recording from. Motor unit changes, none initially, right? So if it's a partial axonal nerve injury, we will have a reduced number of motor units working, but the motor units themselves will be normal looking or abnormal looking. They're going to be normal looking because it takes months for them to become enlarged and prolonged and polyphasic, okay? So those re units take a couple of months, three months. So it's the distribution of the changes that diagnose, you know, a distal symmetric process versus a single nerve or multiple nerves. So a mononeuropathy, mononeuritis multiplex, polyneuropathy, okay? So 
the, in a chronic polyneuropathy, we have fibs, positive sharp waves in, that are going to be declining, less in number, may, maybe none if it's a, a very chronic and re -innervated. We have some changes called complex repetitive discharges, which are abnormalities that occur in a very chronic nerve or muscle condition. Motor unit changes, so we have enlarged, uh, prolonged and polyphasic motor units that are re with reduced recruitment, okay? If it's completely re -innervated, we'll have normal recruitment of big, enlarged, prolonged motor units with no fibrillations and positive sharp waves. So that's the desired outcome. That's where you test the muscle, doesn't look atrophied anymore, it has normal strength, you stick a needle in, it's got normal recruitment but of big, prolonged polyphasic mo that and there are no fibrillations, positive sharp waves, that tells you the process is finished, it's been completely re -innervated. So, the acute changes, the fibrillations, the positive sharp waves, the chronic changes, the recruitment of uh, enlarged and prolonged motor units. So, the Wallerian degeneration, we talked about how long that takes. So, uh, in an acute demyelinating disorder, okay, we have prolonged latencies, conduction velocities that are more than 20% below normal. If the nerve is blocked distal to your most distal stimulation point, then we're going to have low amplitude responses and the patient's going to be weak, but we put a needle in the muscle after a week or a couple of weeks, we'll see no fibrillations and positive sharp waves, and we'll see reduced recruitment of normal motor units. Okay? That tells you that the reduced compound muscle action potential response amplitude I I are due to distal conduction block and not motor axon degeneration. Okay? So here's an example of a Mo the, the peripheral nerve demyelination. So we're doing a motor nerve conduction study here. This is recording from the APB. See how, how dispersed the response is? It takes the, and even here at the elbow. And the conduction velocity here is 20 meters per second. Okay? Now you know that this is an acquired demyelinating process, not a, an inherited one, because the responses are so dispersed. In, a, in, an, in, in an hereditary demyelinating polyneuropathy, the responses would not be dispersed. They would look the same with the distal and proximal stimulation point, okay? But the conduction velocity would be very slow. That's because it's a dismyelinating problem in Charcot-Marie II. The nerves are all equally demyelinated or dismyelinated. In an acquired poly demyelinating polyneuropathy, the nerves are you know, they vary in how badly demyelinated they are along the course, okay? So the responses get very, it's like having, uh, sending out a hundred trains, they all got to get to Penn Station, uh, if the nerve, you know, they all travel different distances, some get delayed, that's how the nervous, n peripheral nervous system works, okay? If it's, it's an exaggerated delay, the trains all start arriving at different times and the response gets very spread out, okay? So, uh, so the in nerve conduction studies in a chronic axonal process, low amplitude, the latency can be a little prolonged if you have a loss of large rapidly conducting axons, uh, you uh, and get prolonged late responses, meaning those F waves and uh, H reflexes. Here, for example, this is an axonal process. You have a mild prolongation of the distal motor response latency and a conduction velocity, okay, that's normal. Okay, because in an axonal process, all you need are a small number of normally conducting nerve fibers to get a normal conduction velocity, because it's a latency measurement that determines the conduction velocity, not the size of the response. So here you have low responses, no block, normal velocity, and a little prolonged latency because of a loss of the most rapidly conducting axons. Okay, so. Okay, we talked about it. So here's a, let's look at the uh, median motor neuropathy at the wrist, for example. So here you have a prolonged latency, 8.98 meters per second. Low amplitude, okay? And this is the uh, uh, elbow, conduction velocity is 46. So it's slightly reduced here. The latency is prolonged, okay, because of conduction block or delay through the median nerve through the wrist. And the response is slow. Or, or sorry, small, because of either a loss of rapidly conducting motor axons or there is conduction block at the wrist. How, do we, how would we distinguish that? 
you would put a needle in the abductor pollicis brevis, and if there were fibrillations and positive sharp waves, that would tell you that this low amplitude was due to motor axon loss. If they weren't there, and, and they should have been there, there was enough time for them to be there, then that would tell you that it's demyelinating. Another thing you could do is you could stimulate the median motor nerve fibers in the palm, okay, below where the problem is. And you might get a response, you know, three, four times bigger than this one, okay? And here, the sensory response is absent, okay? So, that's uh, me median neuropathy at the wrist. So why do we bother doing needle EMG if the patient has prolonged the and an absent median sensory response or delayed median sensory response, and the older nerve conduction studies are normal and the superficial radial sensory conduction studies are normal, why do we bother doing needle EMG? Well, because if you have numbness tingling in uh, any of these three fingers, right, what kind of nerve root problem does that? What level? No, nerve root. Or? Middle finger? Seven. Okay, so do the nerve conduction studies help? You know, you're recording from the APB ulnar nerve. That's this one's T1 anterior horn cell. This is C8 nerve root anterior horn cell. They're, they don't diagnose C6, C7 radiculopathies. Okay, radiculopathies, didn't I tell you? They're proximal to the dorsal root ganglion. Sensory nerve conduction studies are going to be normal or abnormal. Normal, right? So, it's, so you got to do the needle EMG. You got to put the needle in some C6, C7 muscles in the arm to make sure there isn't a, what we call a double crush, right? So if you have a median nerves, numbness, pain, you, yeah, you can have carpal tunnel here, but it could also be due to C6, C7 radiculopathy, okay? So you need to look at some C6, C7 muscles. So, you know, I look at brachioradialis, pronate arteries, these are C6, triceps, finger extensor, they're C7. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, in the ulnar neuropathy, uh, here we go. So, for example, we stimulate the ulnar nerve at the wrist, and here below the elbow and above the elbow. You can see here that there's a problem between the wrist and the elbow. Okay, and there's even more of a problem across the elbow. It looks like there's a no little or no response across the elbow. Okay, so this is about an ulnar. And you can see that at the wrist, the nerve is intact. So this is a, a sign that the decompression will help. Okay? Uh, it would be even more, uh, a tr uh, a de nerve decompression would be even more, likely to be more successful if, for example, the ulnar digital sensory response was normal as well as the motor one. That would tell you that the ulnar nerve at the wrist is perfectly fine. It's just blocked at the elbow. Okay? You would put a needle EMG in, for example, the abductor digiti minimi or the first dorsal interosseus, and you would see like reduced recruitment, normal motor units, no fibrillations or positive sharp waves. These are all the things that would tell you that this is a good operative candidate. The nerve is alive, it's not damaged, just needs to be decompressed. Okay? But what happens in all focal nerve compression disorders, if you wait or the patient doesn't seek medical care, eventually when you have nerve ischemia from compression, what happens? You know, you initially you start out, you know, you cross your, your knees, you know, and you inject yourself with heroin and you fall asleep with your butt on, on the edge of a stairwell, right? You don't wake up, you don't move, what happens? You start off with getting neuropraxia, right? Compression, ischemia, conduction block, weakness, numbness, okay? You don't wake up, move out of the position, what starts to happen? To the axons. They die, right? That's what happens. So that's when you have a nerve injury, the first thing that happens, think about it, when you cross your legs and your foot goes, it goes numb, right? You, it goes completely numb. Next thing you're like, I can't move my foot, right? That means you have conduction block, sensory and motor conduction block. If it starts to tingle, is that conduction block? Paresthesia is a positive nerve phenomenon or a negative nerve phenomenon? Positive. positive. It's a good thing, right? That means you probably uncrossed your legs, you're starting to shake it, and you say, oh, it's starting to tingle, right? That's due to spontaneous nerve fiber uh, uh, depolarization, which happens when the nerve is, uh, 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 there is there's some return of uh, uh, blood supply to the nerve.
Okay, so it starts to de 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 spontaneously depolarize. So that's uh, ulnar neuropathy. So le let me just go over some. Uh, so we, yeah. So here is now in the perineal motor neuropathy. We're stimulating the perineal nerve at the ankle, fibular head, and now we're stimulating above the fibular head. This is classic conduction block, 50% drop. Okay, and here you can see that the nerve. Below the fibular head is perfectly fine. Its sensory response is fine. Okay. So let's say, uh, w which would be the first axons, by the way, to degenerate? Or which, which, are the which are the axons to become symptomatic first with conduction block or de and or degeneration? Sensory or motor? Which are more prone to injury? Sensory. Sensory. Okay. So the sensory axons are the first ones to disappear. So. Here we have a superficial perineal sensory response at the ankle that's normal. Okay? So this tells you that the nerve is just blocked and it's alive. Okay? So the first thing, if, it was, if this was reduced but still blocked and the perineal sensory response was absent, that would predict when I put a needle, EMG, needle into the tibialis anterior muscle, I would see serious things like fibrillations, positive sharp waves, okay? instead of just reduced recruitment of normal motor units. All right? So, so it's, the, it's the state of the nerve distal to the problem that uh, determines the uh, recovery. So if we look at radiculopathy, the nerve conduction studies show normal or low amplitude compound muscle action potentials in the corresponding, this should say, my myotome, myotome, right? So if we were recording from the, and by the way, when we're doing upper extremity nerve conduction studies, we record from the APB, which is supplied by the T1 nerve root, and we record from the abductor digiti minimi, it's supplied by the C8 nerve root. How often do you guys see T1 radiculopathies or C8 radiculopathies? Are they, they the most common ones you see? Hmm? No. What do you see most commonly? Six or seven, right? So do we do motor nerve conduction studies from the pronator teres muscle? or the extensor digitorum communis, or the triceps? We don't, no. Why? It's difficult. So let's say we tried to do a, a motor nerve conduction study from the triceps muscle. All right, I can put it, it's an active electrode here, a reference electrode here. Then I'm like, okay, let's see. So I've got to stimulate the what? What nerve? The radial nerve. I have to stimulate the radial nerve. That's not so easy. I got I, I, a lot of fat. There's a muscle here. I got to get into the spiral groove in the posterior aspect of the humerus. It's very it's it's like literally centimeters away from where my active electrode is. So I'm going to get a big, a lot of stimulation artifact. That would be my distal stimulation point. Where would my proximal stimulation point be? Difficult. It could be in the armpit or at herbs point where I'm stimulating the plexus. So you have to understand there are technical problems with recording from proximal arm or forearm muscles. You can see how it's easy to do because you're stimulating just in the forearm. Okay? So, so therefore, motor nerve conduction studies in the upper extremities are only good for diagnosing C8 or T1 radiculopathies. Okay? No, so what would you get? You would get a normal or low amplitude CMAP okay, if there was a loss of motor axons at, at the nerve root level. Okay? You would also have prolonged F waves. Uh, that could be due to a loss of rapidly conducting motor axons, or it could be due to a compression of motor axons in the nerve root, okay? demyelination, compression, or neuropraxia. Now, so the, so the motor nerve conduction studies aren't very useful. In the, uh, they're useful in the leg because we record from the extensor digitorum brevis muscle on the dorsal aspect of the foot, and we stimulate the perineal nerve at the ankle and the fibular head. And what, what, what nerve root is that assessing? Extensor digitorum brevis muscle, stimulating the deep perineal nerve at the ankle and at the common perineal nerve at the fibular head. What nerve root does that reflect? No. L5, right? Toe extensor muscles, right? To L5, right? L5. So if you have a process that's damaged the L5 nerve root, okay, then if I put a, my, my a reference electrode and Wallerian degeneration has occurred, which, by the way, is that, is that just going to take like five days? It's going to take a lot. Let's say you, you, you're doing a mo median motor conduction study and there's been an injury of the median nerve at the wrist. 
okay, a real, an axonal injury. How long does it take for Wallerian degeneration to develop there? It's just a few days, less than a week, five days. What about at the L5 nerve root? You're recording from a muscle way down there. Nerve injuries here. It's going to be two weeks longer. It's going to take more. T that's the long. That's the nerves got to die back all the way back. Okay, so there's still going to be living nerve axons. Okay, for up to two weeks or more. Okay, about two weeks. See, so it's more. It takes longer here with this one. Okay, but the so the thing that's most helpful then is the needle EMG in a nerve root disorder. If you wait, okay, you'll see the fibrillations and positive sharp waves. Plus, the most importantly, the sensory nerve response will be normal. Okay? Uh, so, denervation in a segmental myotomal distribution, you've got to look for at least two muscles innervated by the same root by more than one peripheral nerve. So, if you think of a C7 radiculopathy, you're looking to see, and there's been enough time for fibrillations, positive shot waves to develop. You want to do the needle EMG, for example, in the triceps, and you go, oh, that's radial nerve. Okay. So now I want to do a C7 muscle that's not radial. Okay, so I'll do the flexor carpi radialis. That's median nerve. So you understand how you've got, you got to get the changes in the muscles that are supplied by the same nerve root but different nerves. Okay? Then it's also helpful to put the needle in the paraspinal muscles because they're supplied by the dorsal ramus okay, of the uh, nerve root. Okay? And they develop fibrillations and positive sharp waves too. In actual fact, they develop the fibrillations and positive sharp waves first because they're closest to where the nerve injury is. And they lose the fibrillations and positive sharp waves first as a result of reinnervation. Okay? So you just you do it at the level, you know, you feel, you know, you feel the neck here, you feel the vertebra prominence, that's C7. You know that below that, that's where the C8 paraspinal uh, uh, nerve root muscle paraspinal combination is, above C7, and you use those markers to put the needle in. So the sensory nerve conduction studies are normal in radiculopathy. Motor nerve conduction studies may demonstrate, oh shit, uh, may demonstrate decreased CMAP amplitude, but only if the nerve root that's affected I I is affecting the muscle that you're recording, is doing the surface recording from. So here we go. Here you have a, uh, a patient with low tibial C-maps, okay? We're recording in this case from the abductor halysis or the flexor halysis brevis, okay? All right, and let's say the needle EMG of that muscle shows fibrillations, positive sharp waves, reduced recruitment of normal motor units. And the sural sensory response, right, is normal. So what's that tell you? Tells you that the weakness and denervation in this muscle is due to what? And by the way, the tibial H reflex, let's say it's absent. Mm -hmm. It's an axonal injury because you had fibrillations and positive sharp waves. Okay? Yeah. And uh, the, where's the location of the disorder? Is it in the plexus, the sciatic nerve, or the nerve root? S1 nerve root. It has to be S1. This is an S1 muscle. Which is it? This is normal. Sensory conduction study. So that tells you this is what? Nerve root or, or it's nerve or nerve root problem? No. Root, because the sensory conduction study is normal. Okay, the pro that tells you the problem. The problem is pre-ganglionic. It's a pre-ganglionic problem. In a post-ganglionic nerve disorder, the sensory conduction study is small. Okay, so radiculopathy, the dorsal root ganglion is formed after exiting the foramen. Okay, so in patients with extra foraminal disc herniations or extra foraminal nerve root compression, you can have a reduction of the sensory nerve response. Okay, but only then. So you can consider nerve root as a cause of a low sensory response only when you have something on the scan that is extra foraminal. Okay. So 